Hi again, everybody. Welcome into an all-new edition of No Hold'em Back, episode 51. And for our 51st episode, we go to the West Coast. Jason Zone Fisher, who I've worked with the last couple of years, joining me today. Jason, how are you, bud? I'm doing great, man. I'm honored to be here on the show, um, trying to just survive this 2020 quarantine experience and getting to spend some time catching up with a friend and chatting about uh, what we love and miss sports. Yep. Uh, and and work is uh, is a blast. It's you know checking an hour off my my list to get through the year. So thank you. Well, that means a lot, bud. Thank you. And you know, in the last couple, so just so folks out there know the kind of the backstory. You and I, we've worked together the last two years doing the WAL. Jason's our pit reporter. Does an awesome job. He's entertaining. He's knowledgeable. He's funny. He's prepared. All those things. Does a great job with us. And it was a great addition to our show. And. We're hoping to get it going in August uh, in Chicago. I know you're chomping to get back to it as well, just like me, right? Absolutely. I mean, this is just a, a hard time for everyone. The year 2020 has been and everything that we're dealing with, but especially for, you know, for people like us who, who work in sports, who yeah. love to travel, who have been, you know, we're, we have these rhythms that have been disturbed. We need to work. We need to connect with people and we're adapting as this is case in point, the podcast yeah. right <laughs> here, uh, right. finding new ways to have creative outlets and to connect with friends and, and still talk about sports. Um, but it, it's been a challenge. So I'm definitely eager to start doing what we love doing best, which is connecting with people, telling stories and, and covering sports. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm sure it's the same for you, man. Mentally has been, you know, that's been the, that's been the hardest part for me, man. What about you? Has that been the only part or have there been other parts that have been difficult for you during this? Yeah. You know, at first when the world kind of shut down in, in early March, uh, I think I lost maybe 10 jobs in two days and wow. I was taking it really personally. It was hard because I had so many gigs lined up that were going to be a lot of fun, a lot of travel, seeing friends, uh, doing the work that I love the most. So I was, I was pretty bummed and in a dark place. But then soon after, I mean a few days literally, I realized this is not just me. This is affecting everybody. And I've got it pretty good. I'm here with my wife and our two-year-old daughter. I live in Los Angeles. We're all healthy and safe. So I try to remind myself uh, that I've got it good. A lot of people have it a lot worse. I'm very grateful. doesn't make it any easier in the day-to-day, -day, missing all of those things that we talked about that I, that I love so much. But, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of big things happening in this year, 2020 right now, besides just uh, COVID-19. So I'm, I'm grateful for all that I have and for all that I have done. And, and I know that we will continue to adapt and we'll find a way back. But uh, it has definitely been uh, a challenge on the mind uh, to, to get through this, you know, just taking it a day at a time. Yeah, you and I talked, what, about a month ago, I think it was. We hadn't talked yeah. in a while. And you know, I'm in a similar place too, like yourself, you know, I just kind of had to get myself into a, get myself back to a center of gratitude, to be honest with you. That's, and that's important to me. I mean, I'm positive. You are too. Like your shirt says, man, he's a fun guy. As you're going to find <laughs> yeah, out totally. here in the next hour, uh, Jason's a really fun guy and he's got a lot of, a lot of great stories and a lot of great things that he's done and he's continuing to do. Um, but as we do on here, um, I kind of like to go like kind of point A to point B. Um, and as I told our buddy Warren Pick, we taped him the other day. Warren directs our uh, and produces our WAL shows for the World Arm Wrestling League. I said, there's no time, man. Like, you know, he's not going to be in your ear. Ten seconds, you know, he's right, not going to be in right. my ear. Fifteen, man, get out. So we got as much time as it takes, man, to, to do it right. And uh, so the first thing well, I want to do. I got about do... six hours. I, I don't know about you, <laughs> but, you know, I got a two-year-old in the, in the house. So I, Napping? let's just say this lasted six hours if it doesn't. I need a break. <laughs> Is she napping now? She is napping right now. Yes, yes. all right. Yes. So you yes. got a little break from, from dad duty then. Exactly. And it's a lot of fun. It's just a lot of work, you know. Yep. Well, mine's 19 now, as you know. So i uh, been there yeah. with you, man. So uh, that's awesome. So the first thing I want to do, I didn't realize, you may have told me this, but, you know, you sent me to a good place this morning. I uh, did some research. I uh, learned a little bit more about you. So I didn't know that your mom and your sister both have the middle name of Zone like yourself. So you got to tell us where that comes from because you got one of the most unique names I've ever seen. Oh, yeah, thanks. You know, 
Everyone always thinks Zone is like my stage name or something, my middle name, especially living out here in LA and Hollywood right. where everything's fake. I was like, no, that is my real middle name. It's my mom's maiden name. So okay. uh, she's from the Zone family and half my family are the Zones. I actually started acting when I was uh, in the fourth grade professionally in TV movies, commercials and plays. And you had to know kind of what what is your name on the playbill and on your headshots and resume? And I, I decided when I was, you know, six, seven years old, I want to be Jason Zone Fisher. There's a lot of Jason Fishers out there. And I come from two great families, the Fisher family and the Zone family in Cleveland, Ohio. I wanted to kind of rep them both. So, uh, you know, I'm proud of that. And it's a cool middle name. Uh, it you is. know, it's just, it backfires sometimes when everyone's like, what's the deal with that? Think I'm, you know, <laughs> trying to be funnier than I am. Uh, it's just my name. I, I mean, I, when I first, when I first knew you were, found out you were at it, that's kind of what I was, I was like, who's this guy? Yeah, exactly. You know, like, and then right. I get to know you, obviously, and you're a hell of a good guy. So that's, <laughs> that's cool. So you mentioned the acting. Yeah. So one of the first things that I saw that you did when you were nine um, was at the Cleveland Playhouse. Right. But take me back, take us back to where did that, was it your, your parents? Did they mm -hmm. have a background of that? I, I read your dad was a lawyer. We'll get into that. Um, so where did that come from? How did you get, how did you get involved in it at such a young age, man? Yeah, it's interesting. Well, so my dad, uh, he did go to law school and was a lawyer, but then went on to become a, a politician. Uh, he was the uh, lieutenant governor of Ohio, oh, attorney yeah. general, state senator. My whole life growing up, uh, I had never seen a parade. I was only in parades. I would go to a big event in front of thousands, with thousands of people there, and usually one of my two parents were the ones speaking at these events. And I was not drawn to politics because there are good people in it, but there's a lot of downside to politics, as, yep. as you can see today. Oh, yeah. um, but I was drawn to certain aspects of it, uh, kind of the campaigning and the performance parts of it, the giving the speeches. I always think part, part of that is probably genetic, is who I am, and part of it might be learned from that, just seeing my parents kind of always being on. and. I was always the kid in the neighborhood. I'd gather all my friends together and I'd put on shows and plays and I'd sell tickets and I'd be hustling friends and family to make money doing performances. And I decided to audition um, for uh, a play at the Cleveland Playhouse, which is the largest professional theater uh, in Cleveland. It's actually the largest between, um, I think, uh, New York and Chicago. Uh, and. Uh, I got picked as the understudy for this role. The play was called Conversations with My Father. I was the only actor who was not from New York or Los Angeles. And through a few uh, months of uh, rehearsals, uh, the understudy actually became the lead actor. And I kind of swapped with the, the understudy. My, I was the understudy. He became my understudy. And gotcha. I, I was addicted. I loved it. Uh, I would go, I was in fourth grade. I would go from fourth grade school. My mom would pick me up and take me downtown to the Cleveland Playhouse where I'd have hours of rehearsals or then performances uh, at night. And I knew from a very young age that that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to act, I thought. And I went on to be in a lot of TV movies and commercials and various other plays until when I was in high school, the Cleveland Browns uh, had left and became the Baltimore Ravens and a new franchise was being established in 1999 uh, yeah. coming back. And there was this five year period in Cleveland where there was no professional football. So the team wanted to attract a younger audience who wasn't used to NFL football in town. And they had a Saturday morning kids show on the local NBC affiliate called Browns Blitz. They had an open casting call and I decided to audition and I got picked as the host of this show. And for me, being a big sports fan, this was a dream come true. I could, instead of playing a role, I could be myself or, you know, a turned on, exaggerated version of myself on the field for all the games, hanging with the players in the locker room, playing video games with this. And that sort of introduced me to the world of hosting and broadcasting. And I was like, this is better than acting. This is what I want to do for a living. I want to be myself. And, and it kind of took off from there, kind of the career path that I wanted to take. That's awesome. Were you were you active in sports? Were you like me? Did you play every sport growing up? Yeah, I played every sport. Uh, basketball still is and always was my favorite sport, yep. uh, both to play and to watch. But I played a little bit of everything. And 
I never really thought that, uh, you know, uh, it could be a profession. Uh, I did think that I had a chance to make the NBA when I was in sixth grade. and, and the, We all know, did, we, right? Yeah, we all thought, you know, <laughs> right. I lived that dream for a little while, but clearly right. I realized that that wasn't how it was going to happen. But <laughs> I... I've learned that a camera and a microphone for me are the tools that can unlock any door. I've met yep. incredible people. I've gone amazing places through these pieces of equipment. Uh, and that Browns Blitz show was kind of the eye-opening moment that I'm, I'm not going to be a professional athlete, but I can feel like a professional athlete on the field for these games, hanging with these guys with a camera and a microphone. Yeah. I mean, it, hearing you talk about that reminds me of it, very similar. My grandfather was a PA announcer. Cool. I was about nine years old. I knew that's what I wanted to do. And that's, yeah. I mean, you know, man, we've both done this for a long time, man. It's As I always say, what we do is better than a real job. But a lot of people say, oh, you got a real job. You travel and all that. But come on, man. No, right? Yeah. At the end of the day. Um, so growing up, growing up in Cleveland. So who was your squad? Was it the was it the Cavs, the Indians? Was it all of them, the Browns before they left? What was the deal there? Yeah, I've always been a loyal, diehard Cleveland sports fan, which God has love been you. very, very difficult. <laughs> it is a trying experience. I've, it's taught me how to deal with adversity and heartbreak and heartache. I mean, my entire life, I, I knew the drive, the shot, the fumble, the decision, uh, game seven yeah. when the Indians blew it in 1997. I mean, all these moments where... Cleveland gives you hope. Their teams, they rally behind them, and they get close. And you think, you believe that they're going to do it until they find a new way to break your heart, um, which is why I was so excited in 2016 when finally Cleveland won a championship. And I was there for Game 7 in Oakland. Uh, it was yep. one of the greatest experiences of my entire life uh, when the Cavs won. But, yeah, I've always been a Cleveland sports fan. And the Cleveland sports, it is just so ingrained with the fabric of that city. Just hardworking, blue-collar people, and they identify in their teams. And we've been through a lot together. It's Cleveland sports fans are kind of like a support group for each other because <laughs> we know, the only ones who know what it's like to deal with all that are, are each other. And it, it's, it kind of bonds the city together. Yeah. Uh, as you know, I lived out in Westlake a couple of years, and I worked for the Lake Erie Monsters. So I, can, yeah. I understand what you're talking about. Some may not. Sure but you're spot on, obviously, being from there. Um, speaking of that 2016 game, one of the clips I saw, and you got a heck of a resume reel, by the way, too, young man. Oh, thanks. But one of the clips I love, you're like, I, I forget exactly how it went, but you said there was somebody, I think there were young kids there, and you're like, it's been 52 years. I mean, right. what were you, tell me what you were feeling. Take me back, man. Put me in that, that moment the best you can now, man, when oh, the Cavs well. finally won. It was incredible. Um, I was lucky. I went back home to Cleveland for all three of the games that were in Cleveland in that NBA Finals that season 2016 and found a way in the arena for all of them. And then we forced a game seven and I knew I, I got to be there. I mean, this is the closest that we've ever been. We could do this. We could pull this off. So uh, I went to the game with uh, two of my best friends and my brother-in-law and uh, I bought a ticket for, I want to say maybe twelve or $1,300, which is a lot of money to spend on a <laughs> ticket. But yeah. in hindsight, the right. best money I have ever spent in my entire life, I was about 20 rows behind the basket, the basket where LeBron had the block. I was about 20 yep. rows behind that. And oh, the whole game, I was a nervous wreck. I didn't sit down once. I was just thinking, oh, how, how are we going to blow this? I think there were 90 <laughs> seconds left, and it is a tie game. And I realized that, like, the fate of the NBA, if you think about it, came down to that 90 seconds. If the Cavs don't pull that out, Kyrie Irving doesn't hit that shot, LeBron doesn't have that block, and the Cavs lose, Kevin Durant probably does not go to play for the Warriors the next yep. season uh, because they're already two-time champions. And, and just everything. Would LeBron have left? I don't know. He didn't fulfill what he came back to Cleveland to do. Everything went down to those 90 seconds. And... My entire lifetime, and, and as you said, the last 52 years of Cleveland sports leading up to that moment, came down to those 90 seconds. And when it finally was over and the final buzzer rang, it, it was a surreal experience. Like I was in a movie. It did not even seem real. And once it finally set in, when the uh, Warriors fans started leaving the arena and it's just Cleveland fans still in there cheering and going crazy, 
I, I just, I lost it. I, I broke down, I started crying. I've got photos of me, uh, tears streaming down my face. And I, then I knew, uh, all right, we got a party. And I went back to Cleveland for the parade. And the, the video you referenced is at the parade in Cleveland when over all 2 right. million people showed up on the streets to celebrate yeah. together. It was one of the happiest times of all ever. And one of the reasons I love sports so much, and this is important, especially now in the year 2020, Sports is such a unifying force. It brings together people from all races, all religions, all socioeconomic backgrounds. It unites us. And the city of Cleveland, it was such a beautiful day, a beautiful experience. Everyone came together, hugging each other, high-fiving friends. You know, strangers became family that day. And, and it was a beautiful thing. And I hope I get to experience it again one day with another Cleveland Sports Championship. But... Nothing will ever be like that one, the first one. It was really a once-in-a-lifetime experience. I'm glad that I was, I was working the parade and got to film it and document it. That's another thing with what we do that's so great. Not only do we get to live these moments, but our job is to document them. So we yep. have them to look back on, too, which is a really special thing. Yeah, that's awesome. I love, I love hearing those kind of stories, man, because I got to know a lot of people that had grown up like yourself that were – you know, 20, 30 years older uh, in a couple of years I was there. And, and I, I, they, they wanted me to understand. They said, look, you're from Detroit, man. You guys have won a lot. The Red Wings, the Pistons, yeah. I mean, the Lions, whatever. Um, yeah. And I've always argued, who's the worst franchise, the Lions or the Browns? You know, the Tigers <laughs> did good. So I get it, man. So yeah. I want to, I want to throw this at you. So LeBron leaves. And I say this because you, you mentioned it was like a movie and it was surreal. Mm -hmm. and, and the way it all played out, Jay, was like, Everyone's pissed when, when LeBron left. Everyone was pissed. There wasn't yeah. one person in Cleveland who was happy. Oh, we know yeah. that. He goes, he wins, he comes back, he delivers. Um, you know, him leaving, were you surprised that he left when he did a couple of years ago to go to the Lakers? Um, I was not surprised. You weren't. The writing was on the wall, and especially okay. in that last run to the finals where – they lost to the Warriors. It wasn't even a series, but it was such an accomplishment. LeBron carried that team. This is yep. the year that Kyrie Irving had already left. Kevin Love was not quite the same level that he used to be. It was LeBron willing that team, uh, getting past uh, the Indiana Pacers in seven games, getting past the Toronto Raptors, getting past all these hard fought, the, the Boston Celtics Eastern Conference Series to make the finals. By the time we got there, Excuse me, and especially after that first game where J.R. Smith forgot the score and we oh could have called God. a timeout and that whole moment, our best chance to win that game. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it, it became clear to me, the writing was on the wall, that Cleveland just, we didn't have the assets to to continue competing at that level. He had to do too much, especially as he was entering his 16th, 17th year uh, in the NBA. Listen, I moved from Cleveland to Los Angeles. I get it. He did what... <laughs> He did. He, he followed, followed your lead. Footsteps. Yeah, I paid right. the way for him, for LeBron. You know, he LeBron, he did what he set out to do, which was bring Cleveland a championship. And when he left the second time, I think everyone in Cleveland said, I get it. Thank you. We still yeah, love right. LeBron. And right. it's a much different feeling because we won that championship in 2016. So now I do not root for the Lakers, but I do root for LeBron. I want him to be, you know, have a successful end to his career. And I think years from now, we're going to continue debating who's the greatest of all time, Michael Jordan or LeBron James. I don't know. I think when it's all said and done, it could be LeBron James. His story is still being written. Could we'll, be, yeah. We'll see how it ends. Yeah, no, it's a good point. Um, all right, so let's get back to kind of your path. Um, and fun to talk about that. I got some other yeah. things Cleveland-wise I'm going to get, get to at the end. But I want to, I want to, you know, get your story out there and all, all the stops you've made, if we can possibly do that in under six hours. <laughs> yeah, right, right. But uh, so from from high school, you mentioned last thing we kind of touched on in terms of your path and your career was that show you did for the Browns, a couple of Emmy nominations, awesome. I know you didn't win, but to be a high school kid doing that's pretty damn cool. So you go really to cool. Syracuse, uh, known for its broadcasting school. I mean, Bob Costas, Mike Tirico, names go on and on. Mm -hmm. Kenny Albert, the list is endless. Um, so when you went to Syracuse, what was, what was your, when you first walked in there, what was it? You, you had it figured out that you wanted to work in sports. Was there anything specific you wanted to do in terms of working in the field? Like, did you want to be a reporter? Did you want to be a play-by-play -play guy or what was it? 
Yeah. Uh, so as you mentioned, I went to Syracuse, the, the new house school of communications, yep. this hallowed ground in, yep. uh, in our profession where so many uh, greats have gone uh, on to do incredible things. And they, they started there. Um, I didn't know when I went in what exactly I wanted to do. I knew that I wanted to do something on air. I knew it, I love sports and I would love to do something in sports, but I felt that there wasn't really an exact major for what I wanted to do because I learned all the fundamentals at Syracuse of broadcasting, of reporting, of producing, of editing, of being on air, of writing, of all these things that I would take uh, as a foundation for whatever path that I wanted. But the, I did get a lot of notes and feedback from my great professors that I was often maybe too much personality, you know, or in, injecting too much of my opinions. You know, I'm trying to be the funny weather guy or the sports guy who's rooting for a team, and you're not supposed to do that. And I, I sort of realized that they weren't teaching exactly what I wanted to do, but I could learn the basics and apply it to what I wanted to do. And what I wanted to do is just kind of continue just being myself on camera i'm a sports fan i'm a diehard cleveland fan and i, I don't want to hide that you know i want to be fair and balanced and impartial but i'm also not as a human being we're all human beings we have people and teams that we root for and uh you know i also learned that the local news is very important but it's very depressing it's a lot yeah. of house fires and murders yeah. and car crashes. And they yeah. really prepare you out of college to do that. And I knew that is not what I want to do. I do not yeah. want to be the bearer of bad news. I like making, making people feel good. And I wanted to do that for a living, whether it be through sports or entertainment or comedy. And, and I've kind of, my career has ventured into various worlds, not just broadcasting, not just sports, but also as I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about, uh, you know, a lot of fun. I hosted a, a roller coaster show on Travel Channel, and like I just have fun for a living. I try to make people smile and try to be relatable, and and you know, do things that are a little more lighthearted than uh, you know, who who died in a house fire. That's that's right. not for me. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you, man. I wrote news for a year and a half in Detroit, so I, I get it, man. That was my first yeah. job uh, in the in the business, and uh, yeah, it, it's depressing, but. Like you said, you you had a lot of different things like I did that taught me, that prepared me like I know they did you. So who is uh, in sports? Obviously, Syracuse known for, I'm going to say this because my son's a lacrosse player, so I'm putting it first. Syracuse known for lacrosse and basketball. So who are some of the, who are some of the studs they had back then in their sports programs when you were there? Well, I'll start with lacrosse. The The Powell brothers were there oh, nice. when I was there. I mean, yeah. there's a, a great lacrosse tradition starting with yep. Jim Brown and the Gates brothers. And then yep. uh, I think Mikey Powell was there. He would do a backflip lacrosse shot. I went to some lacrosse games. That was incredible. But, I mean, my college career, especially coming from Cleveland, where I never won anything my freshman year, also a freshman with me was Carmelo Anthony. Oh, Talk nice. about good timing. We win a national championship my first year of college. That was my first experience of like, you're, you're allowed to win at sports? I didn't know what this was like. This was amazing. And right. to be able to win a Final Four in New Orleans, I mean, there's like no better city to have your team win in and celebrate. I actually was at the Final Four in New Orleans and watch them win that. And then I went back to Syracuse for the national championship game on the Monday to watch in the carrier dome with all my friends and then just go party uh, on Marshall street and all throughout the campus at Syracuse. It was, it, it validated. All right. I, I went to the right school. I made the right choice because I'm never going to have another experience like this before. Uh, Syracuse football has a pretty rich tradition and history as well. But yeah. Fortunately, not for the four years that I was there. No. Uh, freshmen would go to the Carrier Dome for football games and then soon realize that this team is not very good and sophomores, juniors, and seniors never went to football games. And that was kind of what it was like for the four years that I was there. So I went to a lot of football games my freshman year, but it was really a basketball school and a lacrosse school uh, when I was there with Jim Beheim and the national championship with Mello. Yeah, well, you just missed you missed out by a few years on Donovan McNabb. He was there before you, obviously. And of course, you mentioned Jim Brown, obviously uh, one of the greatest athletes that's ever walked the planet. So yeah. both in football and lacrosse, as we know, you and I know, and those that don't, 
I mean, they changed the rule. You know, he used to carry the ball against his chest and right. couldn't do that because nobody could get it from him. Yeah, uh, arguably who, he's a better lacrosse player than football player, which yeah, is hard to believe yeah. because he's known as the greatest football player of all time. Right. Yeah. Who are some of the other broadcasters that now have gone on to do great things like yourself that you were in class with at Syracuse? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, some friends of mine who I was uh, at Syracuse with, uh, Nick Friedel, he's on ESPN. He was a beat, rep uh, beat reporter for the Chicago Bulls and then the Golden State Warriors. He's an NBA reporter. He's a good friend of mine. Okay. Um, Adam Lefko from Bleacher Report and now the NBA on TNT. He was there the same time I was. Um, those are the first two that come to mind kind of from my uh, age. But there's, there's a lot of guys uh, who are still working yeah. Uh, play by play, Matt Martucci, um, yep. lots of people that I uh, keep in touch with um, from Syracuse who are are out there doing great things on all different levels at all different sports and in in different industries. Um, that's I think what makes Syracuse such a valuable place for a broadcaster isn't even necessarily what you learned in those classrooms. It's who you're there with, who else you're, you know, was attracted to go to that school, who you're in classes with, and the fraternity of when you get out of it. And I'm sure there's a lot of broadcasters who, who watch this show, listen to your podcast. They know it's kind of like the, the Syracuse Mafia. It's a joke <laughs> in this business where so many people uh, have gone to Syracuse and they really do kind of look out for each other. And, you know, I started getting a lot of internships right out of college and making a lot of connections and they do a great job connecting uh, their alumni, which has been a, a really valuable thing, uh, asset of the school. Yeah. All right. So you mentioned the internships. First job you got out of college. What was it? So as everyone's starting to graduate from college, they're, um, you know, getting these jobs in these small markets in the middle of nowhere, you know, doing one man band reporting jobs for local news, uh, making no money and, yep. and working really hard reporting on, you know, house fires and car crashes. And I was like, right. I, I, this is not for me. So yep. I decided instead of taking that traditional path, I'm going to make a documentary film. I thought it would be a fun project to work on to ease my transition into the real world. You know, just take a couple months, work on something, see where it goes. I think that was the key to my success was being so naive. I had no idea how much work with this would actually be and what I was setting out to do. I partnered with a, a buddy of mine from college who had the same mindset. His name's John and Trader. And five days after we graduated college, we started shooting uh, a documentary. We shot 250 hours of footage. And over the next year, we edited it a year and a half. We edited that down to a 90 minute film. And the film did very well. It played a lot of film festivals. It won awards uh, and it got a distribution deal. The film is called Swing State. And it's about the role that Ohio plays in presidential elections. In the history of American politics, only one president has ever been elected without winning the state of Ohio. It's crazy. It like always comes down wow. to Ohio. And he, he, there's a trivia portion. Any uh, guess who that is? Uh, can I get a decade? Um, I would say, you know, or some Ohio kind of him? parents' generation. Kennedy? Hey, all right. Congratulations. You got it right. Look what do this. I win? You win uh, some hockey memorabilia. It looks like you're already full I need on that. more. You need more of that. Yes, exactly. <laughs> That's cool. You I need a I copy don't... of Swing State, the film. I, I love that. I didn't, know, I didn't know that. Yes, I will send you a copy of the film. That's awesome, So that's man. kind of the backstory for okay. this film. But it's about, I mentioned earlier, my uh, I grew up in a political family. My yeah. dad was uh, in politics my whole yep. life. So it's a behind the scenes look at what it's like to grow up and live in politics. And I interviewed mm -hmm. Barack Obama, Bill and Hillary wow. Clinton, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., John Kerry, all these big names, but not about their politics. I asked them personal questions about what it's like for them and their spouse and their kids to grow up uh, in this bubble and under a microscope and all mm -hmm. the personal sides, the sacrifices of, of living a public life in politics. And the, the film did uh, pretty well, especially for a first time documentary filmmaker to be able to get a distribution deal. I toured the country playing film festivals. It was an amazing learning experience. And I always give the advice. I say it was better than going to film school. If you want to do something like that, just do it. Just do make it, yeah. it yourself if you can. That's that's how I learned so much about the business because literally I learned how to fundraise. I learned pre-production, production, post-production, post marketing, PR, advertising, uh, distribution. I learned the whole business by actually doing it. And, and it was a great experience. And 
and one thing leads to another. That job led to my next job, which was uh, I was the national youth correspondent for CBS News during the 2008 yeah. presidential election. So nice. I got to go to all the debates, the conventions. Whoa, sorry about that. <laughs> Haven't learned uh, how to use this microphone yet, despite all those things. Uh, you know, I, I, I basically uh, had a front row seat for one of the most historic elections of our lifetime when Barack Obama was elected yep. at all the big national events. Uh, from a youth perspective, doing stuff with Katie Couric and the early show on CBS, um, talking to a lot of college students all over the country. So that was a lot of fun. And I lived out of a suitcase going between film festivals with Swing State and campaign events for CBS. Wow. I don't know. I don't think I don't think we've ever got into that. That's really cool. I did not Thanks. know that's uh, that was that was how it really started for you. Um, first on air job. So where was, how did that, how, when was that? How long after the film and all that? When did you decide to, to go that path and what was it? Well, I mean, in my career, it goes back to that, that Brown show uh, yeah. and, and really knowing that this is what I wanted to do. Uh, the documentary, I'd always loved documentary films, but really, again, that was sort of a project that I th thought would be a great way to open a lot of doors and a good experience. And then that led to the CBS News gig, which was a lot of digital media, but it was some stuff on air on the CBS broadcast as well. Um, and when that ended, after Obama's inauguration, I had a great job, but there wasn't really a natural extension for this uh, youth correspondent role. It was a campaign role. So I decided to move out to Los Angeles because, one, growing up in Cleveland and going to college at Syracuse, I was freezing and I was ready right. to like, you know, thaw <laughs> out a little bit. And yeah. I, had, I have family <laughs> in Los Angeles, and any time when I was young and I would visit, I was just so attracted to this city. I, I felt an energy and a rush. So many people who moved to LA because they're taking a bet, a risk on themselves. They believe in themselves. They yeah. want to see what can happen. And there's so many people out here to collaborate with who have that same dream. So I knew I wanted to give it a try. I figured that would be a good time to do it. I didn't know how long I would be in LA. Maybe it would be a year. Maybe it would be three years. Maybe it will be forever. And now here I am, you know, 10 plus years later, still in Los Angeles. And it seems like it is going to be a long term thing. Yeah. Uh, and and really, it was just sort of work begets work. One job leads to another. But when I moved to Los Angeles, I think the the key to the next step in my success that I've had was not from a specific job or, or from working. What it was from was from networking. I moved out here. I knew about eight people and I put their names on a spreadsheet and I spent the first week in LA meeting with those eight people, telling them my story, what I've done that got to this point, much as I have so far in the podcast, yeah, right. giving them a copy of my film. And I yep. said, can you just name one person or maybe two people that you think I should meet with now that you know me that, uh, you know, maybe they can give me some advice. I'm not even, I'm not looking for a job. I'm just looking to meet more people. And those eight people turned into 16, turned into 32, 64, and I kept this spreadsheet up. And within the first year that I lived in LA, I honestly did not have that many paying jobs. I was lucky that I've got an aunt and uncle that I could crash with them for about six months until I got you know uh, my feet under me. But that was so important, that time of just networking and hustling and showing people, not only do I have these dreams, but like if I put my mind to something, I can do it. Here's a movie that I actually made already uh, because so many people come to LA with a dream, but I had uh, the, the results yeah. to show for it, yeah. that it opened a lot of doors and opportunities started coming my way. Sometimes it would be a, a gig or a one-time thing and that would turn into something bigger. Um, but a real turning point in my career was from the most unlikely of places. It was the summer of 2010, so 10 years ago. I got an email from a friend who said, Gillette, the razor company, is having a contest, and it sounds like you'd be good for it. Check it out. And I read this whole thing. You had to, uh, with a friend, it was pairs of two, submit a 60-second video that showed your passion for Gillette. I'm like, <laughs> okay, whatever the hell that means. And they were gonna pick uh, a winner, to travel around America, get paid a ton of money, creating content for the brand at every major summer event. Uh, it sounded amazing as I read all about it, but the deadline was the next day and there Ooh. was already thousands of entries. Now, most people would have said, 
well, screw it. I mean, yeah. like, what are no. the, it's, it's no. too late. Oh, well, next time. I called up my friend Adam, a friend from Syracuse who lives here in L.A., and I said, Adam, this, what are you doing right now? He's like, oh, I don't know, nothing. You know, it's L.A. It's a Tuesday. People are just hanging out. He's like, oh, right. nothing. I was like, well, this sounds crazy, but come over. We're going to enter and win a contest. He's like, okay. So we came up with some ideas, and we, uh, we put together this video. We shot it and edited it in a day. We submitted it. And a few weeks later, we found out we were one of five finalists in the country. We were flown to New York City for this live final event in front of 500 people in the audience and a panel with John Cena and Tony Parker of the Spurs and Aaron Andrews were the judges. And yeah. we got picked as the winners of the Gillette Ultimate Summer Job, where we were driven around America in 25 cities over six weeks in charge of creating content for the brand um, on all their social channels and a website they, they made for us and doing uh, press and PR for them. We were backstage at Lollapalooza. We were on the field at the Baseball All-Star Game. We were backstage at the ESPY Awards. We led the New England Patriots out of the tunnel and did the coin toss at midfield. Wow. We drove NASCARs at the Brickyard 400. We, uh, we spent a day with Derek Jeter in the dugout at Yankee Stadium. We went around town with Pedro Martinez. We were on Sports Center and the Today Show. Every day was like this Jeez. for six weeks. It was insane. Wow. It was amazing. It was like definitely one of the greatest experiences I'll ever have in my entire life. And it kind of was my first experience. So when it ended, I was like, oh, shit, I <laughs> way too soon. What am I going to do? Retire? Right. I got to keep this going. So instead of sending these Gillette executives an email begging them to hire me again, I sent them a video to show them, not tell them, kind of like another contest video. I sent them a video, a comedic thing. And within an hour, we heard back from the vice president of Gillette. He said, we need to talk. And we had a call. And they extended us from the contest winners to the next year and a half as their on-camera host and spokesman at major events, at Super Bowls, MLB All-Star Games, opening days, spring training, NASCAR races. And uh, that, I would say, was sort of my, my first gig uh, in wow. L.A., you know, post-college, post-documentary experience. And and it couldn't have been a better one. I'm, I'm still trying. I'm still chasing that dragon. That was that was the greatest uh, job ever. That sounds like it. Do you still have the spreadsheet? <laughs> I do still have the spreadsheet. Cool. I don't use it quite yeah. as much anymore, but it still sits on my desktop. Yeah. And you know, if I'm ever having a slow day or a down day, I open it up and I see, oh yeah, I haven't talked to the guy in in three years. What is wrong with me? Let me just email him and, <laughs> and touch base. And I do that because one, I just genuinely love people. I really do yep. love connecting with people. It, it comes from a genuine place. Yep. And two, that is often how opportunities have come my way through relationships. You can be, when I moved to LA, I was so amazed. You can take an acting class, a hosting class, an improv class, a comedy class, a directing class. There's courses on all this stuff out here there is no networking course. And I've always thought that might be something I could actually even do. I still think about yeah. it because you can be the most talented person in the world, but if no one knows it, it doesn't matter. You right. have to just get your foot in the door, find any way to get your foot in the door. And then it's up to you to prove that you belong. You have to have the yeah. goods to back it up. But getting your foot in the door is often the most, the hardest part and the most important part. Yeah, and you and I both can relate in that in many ways, uh, as we've both done this for a long time. That's awesome, man. That's really cool. So um, I'm just going to throw this out there. Is there a network that you haven't worked for? Because it would, I could probably sit here and smoke a cigarette and go through. It would take me that long, my friend, to go through all the people you've worked for. Is there, is there one that you haven't worked for? Here's the question. One you haven't worked for that you like to work for? Yeah, there is actually, there is. I okay. uh, have always been a diehard NBA fan, just as you've always been. Yep. Hockey has been yep. your your passion. Yep. Um, and I've done a lot with the NBA. I've hosted yeah. a show on their Twitch channel. I, yep. I've done a lot of social media content for them. I, I host live events. I've hosted four of the last five NBA All-Star Weekends. Yeah. been one of their go-to hosts and MCs. Yep. Um, but I've never done anything for NBA TV. And... NBA TV would be, uh, in some capacity, a dream job. My favorite show when I was a kid cool. was NBA Inside Stuff with Ahmad Rashad. Love that, too. It, it was the best. Getting to know yeah. the players off the court, who their personalities, you know, who they are. That's one of the reasons I fell in love with the league when I was so young, because I got to know these guys as, as people, not just right. as players. And to do something 
for uh, the NBA from a broadcast standpoint, perhaps NBA TV, I, I think that would be a, a goal of mine that, you know, maybe I'll, I'll give myself this next decade to see if I can, I can crack that. Well, I'll, I'll tag him when we put this on Twitter once my son edits it. He's oh, my nice. editor, man. Like, he's, he's the only one that's making any money on this thing right now. I pay him to edit, and I pay <laughs> him to, to co-host shows with me. So, oh, he hasn't good. had a job yet. He's a sophomore in college. So, some might say I'm a bad parent, but I'm just letting him play a sport and do what he wants to do. So, that's um, great. yeah, that's awesome, man. Um, tell me a little bit more about the stuff you've done with the NBA, and specifically – Get into the story about Adam Silver. You shared with me that last year, or maybe yeah. each year we've been together, we've hung out. It's a great story, man. Fire away. I want I want people to hear that. Sure, sure. So, you know, through that uh, Gillette experience, I've had a lot of crazy experiences. I, I did it through a contest. And then um, when I worked with the brand, I worked with many other brands. Because when you work with a brand, anyone who, who has knows this, I call it Conference Call City. You work with their... PR team and advertising agency and marketing agency and all these different agencies that are always working with brands that are really working with many other brands as well. And for me, I found networking with them has been very important because it's led to many more opportunities. So Gillette turned into an opportunity with Nestle Butterfinger Candy Bar, where I was their spokesman on a summer tour traveling around America. <laughs> And Great. I was similarly in 25 cities over six weeks for Nestle's Butterfinger Candy Bar. And uh, that one, I would have two days off every week, but it was just happened to fall in whatever random city I was in. So one week I was in Kansas City with two days off. Um, the first day I had barbecue, one of the best barbecue towns in America. Barbecue for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It was great. The second day... <laughs> You know, I decided nothing against Kansas City. It's a great place, but there's not a ton to do after you've been there for, you know, a day or so. The NBA Finals were going on about seven hours away in Oklahoma City between the Miami Heat and Oklahoma City Thunder. I did not have tickets to the game, but I did not let that stop me. I figured you got to put yourself in the right place at the right time. You figure it out. So I drove seven hours in my giant Butterfinger truck to Oklahoma <laughs> City for game two of the NBA Finals. <laughs> I, without tickets, I just got to get it. there. So <laughs> I parked the truck a couple blocks from the arena. Uh, I'm there a few hours before the game. I'm passing out butterfingers, you know, making people laugh outside, saying what's up, asking people if they have tickets. Literally five minutes before the game starts, I meet a girl. She has an extra ticket to game two of the NBA Finals. I give her a hundred dollars for it. That's like unheard of. You, that you is completely unheard of. For that, yeah, it's yeah. crazy. I can't believe it. I am so excited. This worked. I go in. I go to my seat. I am in literally the last seat in the entire arena. If there was a draft of, of seats, I had the worst pick out of 20-some <laughs> thousand seats. I was in the last row. So, actually, you know, I have a nice, recl you know, uh, backrest behind me because the right, wall right. is behind me. But I right. can't see anything. Like, the right. rafters are blocking my view. The retired jerseys and everything. I'm checking my phone <laughs> to see what the score is. I can't, I'm like, I'm happy to be there but I can't sit up here the whole game. So I'm taking pictures and I'm zooming in to see if there's any open seats. It's the finals, there's no open seats, but I, I think I see one seat happens to be in the second row right behind where the announcers sit and it's open. So in the second quarter, I walk around the main concourse. I figure out what section that is. I get a hot dog and a beer so that my hands are full and I can't reach for my ticket. I walk right up to the usher, I see her name tag. I don't hesitate. Confidence is key. Yolanda, how you doing? You look good. Oh my God, what a season. We're going to win it all. I love you. Go Thunder. I give her a huge hug and like a hurricane. I just don't let her stop me. I just walk right past her after giving her this embrace all the way down to my courtside seat. I am now sitting courtside at the NBA Finals for $100. Look at you. And seven hours ago, I was in Kansas City eating my fourth barbecue meal. I cannot believe this is my life. This is amazing. I'm sitting there for about 15 minutes, loving it, until finally someone taps me on my shoulder. And I say, uh-oh. And I, I turn and I see someone say, excuse me, you're in my seat. I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. There must be a mistake. I start getting up. I'm fumbling, looking for my ticket. I'm really just trying to buy some time and look yeah. around, find another open seat so I can like make a new plan here. And as I'm doing that, I turn and I see about 10 rows up on the aisle, David Stern, the commissioner of the NBA at the time, getting up to go to the restroom. So without hesitating, I walk directly to his seat and I sit in the commissioner's seat. Pretty ballsy. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah, it is. Next to him at the time is Adam Silver, the deputy commissioner of the NBA. Now, not as many people knew who he was back then. And yeah, before he right. has a chance to say anything, like, what the hell are you doing? I say, Mr. Silver, I'm a huge fan of yours. The second round of the NBA draft is my favorite time of the entire season. The way you pronounce those European draft picks, it boggles my mind. He chuckles. It's like, my name's Jason Zone Fisher. I'm a diehard NBA basketball fan. I've been passionate about the game since I was a kid in Cleveland, growing up with Mark Price, Brad Doherty, Larry Nance. I traveled seven hours tonight to be here for this game. I'm traveling the country with Butterfinger. Here's some Butterfinger coupons. He was like, oh, what? What? He was like, who, who the hell are you? What are you talking about? And I took that as an opportunity to tell him about myself and who I am and what I've done and what I'm doing. And he was fascinated. And next thing you know, I've been sitting in the commissioner's seat next to Adam Silver for about 15 minutes talking about all my adventures. And he was loving it. I thanked him for not calling security on me. I, I, I decided I shouldn't press my luck anymore here. I gave him right. my business card and his reflex. He gave me his card right back. And... I, uh, I I thanked him and I said, you know, I'll be in touch. Good timing. As I leave, David Stern is coming back to his seat. I said, Mr. Commissioner, good to see you. Jason Fisher, I just caught up with my old friend, Adam Silver. Tell him I say hi. He's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and flash forward about, I don't know, five months later or so when the Butterfinger Tour was over, I was in New York City. I was hosting an event for the U.S. Open Tennis Tournament. And uh, I emailed Adam. I reminded him in this email who I was. And I said verbatim, at the risk of losing all humility, I know at some point in my career, I'm going to work with you and the NBA. It's a lifelong goal of mine. I feel myself inching closer towards it every day. If you would spend five minutes to sit down, get to know me better, I'd appreciate it. But trust me, it'll be worth your time. Within two minutes, I got a response from him. He said, Jason, of course I remember you. I'm still eating Butterfingers because of you. Uh, I leave for the Olympics soon. It's going to be tough. I'll see if I can make some time. I got a calendar invite from his assistant for a meeting from 11 to 11, 10 a.m., 10 minute 10 window. Minutes. Like, all right, I guess I asked for five. You got to be specific. I showed up to the meeting. Uh, we totally hit it off. He picked up the phone. He canceled. He, he called his assistant. He canceled his next meeting. He then brought in the head of marketing and the head of social media for the NBA. And this 10 minute meeting turned into an hour and a half with Adam Silver. And about a year or so later, David Stern announced his retirement. Adam took over, obviously, as commissioner today. And we are still close friends where uh, I've been his guest at games. Um, we every anytime I'm in New York, I, I have a meeting with him. Uh, we email, you know, semi regularly. He's an amazing guy, a great guy, genuine guy, and he's doing an amazing job as a commissioner. And and that is a pretty funny story, but it, it does sort of sum up a little bit of my hustle and a little bit of yeah. uh, the way I do things. I've I've got a lot of chutzpah and I've got no shame and no fear, and uh, I use that to my advantage to create opportunities out of nothing sometimes. That's tremendous. That's an awesome story, man. Show me, put hold the sign up that you got on your desk. Oh please. yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's see here. Yeah, my plaque. Every right day I'm there, awesome. man. It's a great that's song right, too. Great yeah. saying and a great song. <laughs> that's right. Love that's that. Right, it is. So when? So is that the last time you've you've talked with Adam Silver? Or have you spoken no, to him? Or? No, no, not at all. No, I mean, I I uh, I met with him uh, the last time I was in New York, which was uh, in November 2019. I haven't been there in 2020 uh, for okay. obvious reasons, but right. we had an hour and a half meeting in his office, and uh, we we exchange emails, and literally anytime I'm in New York, we we get together. We've kept in touch. Uh, since then, and, and we found ways to work together too, which is a lot of the work that I've done with the league as a live event MC, yeah. uh, a host on their Twitch channel, social media content, um, various areas uh, with the league. Yeah. That, that's awesome, man. Well, you're going to get there. I mean, we've worked together on what a dozen shows, man. And this guy, he's very talented, folks. Oh, he really is. I'm serious. Um, so you mentioned the Coaster show earlier. Yeah. And I watched some of those clips. I caught a couple episodes last year whenever they were replaying after we were last together. Right. Um, I'm just going to say this. I used to crap my pants on roller coasters. <laughs> my son wanted to drag me on every one he could. Yeah. Um, you, you obviously don't have a fear of heights like that, right? I do not. No, no. I, I'm a bit of an adrenaline junkie, so I yeah. enjoy it. I will say, so I host a show on Travel Channel called Coaster yeah. Quest. Tell, tell us the story, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, yeah. the show uh, Coaster Quest, I basically 
take you around America to amusement parks that you've heard of, like Universal Studios in, in uh, Orlando, and then some you never even knew existed, like uh, Silver Dollar City in Branson, Missouri, or uh, Holiday World in Santa Claus, Indiana, where you the different areas of the park are, you celebrate Christmas and Thanksgiving and Fourth of July and all these different areas where Jay Cutler is from. Exactly. That's what I was waiting for. Yeah. That's right. That's right. <laughs> you read Man. my mind. Uh huh. Yeah. Exactly. How about Cedar Point? Uh, so I've been to Cedar Point many times. Right. Uh, Sandusky, Ohio, not yeah, far yeah. from Cleveland. Growing up, it's the greatest amusement park in the country. Oh, We've not done terrific. it on the show, probably because they don't they don't need the press. But uh, but that is the best one. So the, the show is is about the the food, the people the behind the scenes magic, but then of course all the roller coasters. And I do love roller coasters, they're a lot of fun, but it's not as glamorous as it sounds. There's worse ways to make a living than getting paid to ride roller coasters. However, <laughs> I have to ride the roller coasters in the morning before the park opens. So between 6 a.m. and 9 a.m., it's yeah. me and a bunch of extras because I have to ride it over and over again for all the different camera angles. Right. So. While I like roller coasters, having to ride the same roller coaster seven or eight times in a row at 7 a.m., that gets to be a lot of work by the end. Yeah. 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 I could see that. So is that show, is it still, is it active or are you still doing it? Where's it stand? Oh, well, we're not doing anything right now. Well, not no, now, right? but yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, <laughs> it is it's sort of in a weird Hollywood purgatory, uh, which okay. I, I won't bore you on all the logistics. It's it's not alive or dead. It's somewhere in between for Travel Channel. It's just While, just kind of laying there. Yeah, I think their ad sales department is uh, is working on uh, uh, you know if there are other parks that would like to uh, have us come on board. If you know what I mean. Yeah, but, I got you. Yeah, yeah. So you know Hollywood takes the luster off everything all the shine <laughs> off the fun yeah right yeah so um so that that shows awesome i really like that and oh, like i fun. said yeah. I've, I've gotten over my fear of of those heights that i used to have and mainly because of going up in 12 story you know press boxes whether it's football right. or hockey so that's that's helped me but yeah my son used to laugh because he'd scare the hell out of me um <laughs> you did you did a show called chopped is that one still active or is that on the shelf Are you still involved with that one well, Chopped is one of the most successful um, food television competition shows in television history. Right. Uh, it is still on Food Network. Now, I've never hosted uh, the TV show Chopped. But you they have did, No, but they did a yeah. live tour, an extension of Chopped, where it went to cities all across America uh, because Chopped has got so many fans. So I would go to Chicago, Miami, New York, L.A., all these different cities, and they would have three of the hottest up-and-coming chefs competing in a live competition where they'd open a basket, have no idea what the ingredients are, and have to create a dish. They'd have three of the biggest celebrity chefs from that city there to judge, and I would be the host and MC. And it was a blast getting to travel the country doing that because I got to meet some of the best chefs in America and get the hookups at their restaurants. That's always a nice perk of working in the food. Darn straight. Yeah, and, and get to eat all of those things and just keep it fun and lively because – Obviously, you know, when making a television show, there's often a lot of editing. A 30-minute episode of Chopped can take, you know, seven, eight hours of production to, to produce. But when you're doing it live, the whole show is live over the course of 90 minutes. So it takes a lot to, you know, make sure it runs smoothly and keep the audience engaged, which is what, you know, I, I did for them. That's awesome. I know you're into barbecue. You've got a lot of stuff with that, right, as well? Yeah. What uh, what are some what are some unique stories from uh, from that phase of your hosting, your reporting, whatever it's been, Jay? Yeah, yeah, I have done a lot of barbecue uh, things for the Crafts Bullseye Barbecue Sauce. Um, I was the spokesman for Skype, and they sent me the Big Apple Barbecue Festival. Um, I, I hosted a show on the Big Ten Network called Tailgate Forty Eight, where we that. talk about. Uh, yeah. the best food on college campuses and tailgates and barbecues. So I've sort of become, and I, and I did a series for Kingsford uh, on uh, kind of how to barbecue. So I sort of fell into that accidentally that I've just happened to do a lot of barbecue content, but I love barbecue and traveling the country so much through all the work that I've done, I've gotten to experience the best barbecue in Kansas City and Austin and Memphis and uh, really everywhere that you would want to have a great barbecue. Um, for me, my favorite barbecue, oh man, it's tough. I, I don't know. I, Kansas City, 
is up the Kansas City and and Austin, Texas is yeah. uh, is the best. I'm uh, I, I like a saucy barbecue. Some you know are all about the dry rub. I yeah. I like sauce. I like sauce and I like spice. I got you. I've been to Austin and had it in a few places. I've yet to have it in Kansas City, but okay. I've heard from everybody that's been there, like yourself, that that is the top yeah, spot. Yeah, my favorite place in Kansas City. It was called Oklahoma Joe's, but I think that was confusing for people because it's in Kansas City. So they changed it to Kansas City Joe's, but it's in a gas station and it's incredible. Some of the best uh, wow. pulled pork I've ever had in my life. It's like this hole in the wall you would not expect to be here, but they've got these amazing sandwiches and brisket and pulled pork and the homemade sauces. I picked up a bunch of bottles I still have in my fridge here. It's uh, that That's one of my favorite places in the country for barbecue. It's amazing. That's awesome. I'm sh- I'm ship I'm shifting to a different food now. Yeah. Um. And your love for basketball is is you've told us here in in whatever time we've been talking here, and, and getting to know you. I know your 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 basketball is your sport. You were reti- You're doing stuff with pizza, and you have for a few years with March Madness. So mm-hmm. share some experiences from that. What are some highlights of doing that and being involved in that uh, that entity? Yeah, so another one of my crazy, insane, fun jobs that you didn't even realize was a job is Pizza Hut. Uh, They became, a few years ago, the official pizza of the NCAA, and they named me the Pizza Hut All-American. They sent me in one year to every single NCAA championship in every sport. So Final Four, men's and women's basketball, the College World Series, men's and women's softball, uh, the college football championship, but also bowling, fencing, water polo, lacrosse, field hockey, swimming and diving, track and field, uh, literally 33 different sports that I went to in one year. I'm the only person in history to do that. I talked to the NCAA. They don't even have employees who cover championships. They break it down to like, they're in charge of five or six or two. Like no one has been to all of them at once. Um, It was an amazing experience. Uh, something that I'm so glad that I did. I don't necessarily need to go back to the fencing championship again, uh, (laughs) but I'm glad that I did it once and got to experience these sports. And my job for them, I would run their social media accounts. Um, uh, They've got 30 million Facebook fans. I would do Facebook Live videos. And then it was really like an earned media play too, where Pizza Hut couldn't get free advertising on local morning shows and radio shows and national press, but the Pizza Hut All-American can because that was such a unique story and job that I had that every city I went to across the country, I would do three you know, local radio shows and morning shows. Sports Center did a whole story on me on my journey and what I was doing. And for Pizza Hut, it's a huge win because they didn't have to pay for any of that press. They just yeah. got me out there and I'd kind of weave in the Pizza Hut messaging uh, along right, with my journey right. and my story. It was <laughs> an amazing experience. I did that for one year. And then the next year, they brought me back to go to the big championships, football, basketball, baseball, which uh, was also great. It was a little easier on the travel schedule and I got to go to the heavy hitters. But they've been a blast to work with because I grew up eating Pizza Hut. Um, it's, you know, definitely comfort food that is always delicious and, uh, and loving sports, getting to experience all these things. It was, it was so much fun. It was really, really cool experience. That was really, you should be a pitch man, man. That was like really <laughs> smooth. Nice job. Uh, dude, I've been brainwashed. I got it all. You want, you don't know, I get know about the Gillette Fusion Pro Glide, five blades on the front, one on the back, the precision trimmer, the hydrating lubra strip. You want to talk about the pizza? We got the original stuffed crust or pan pizza. I, I, I know I'm. I'm a brand man. I got it down, baby. Two things. I'm a Gillette guy. I have been for a long time. I can't find the Gillette sensors in the store anymore. And I don't want it. Those ones look like I'm going to cut my neck off. I'll make a call. I'll I'll have that. Figured you would. Yeah, yeah. I'll have that solved. The other, uh, it's more of a comment, I guess maybe a question, but do you get free Pizza Hut for life? Um, No, I do not have free Pizza Hut for life. However... (laughs) I have not bought pizza since then because they did very graciously as a thank you at the end of one of my years, give me this like gold Pizza Hut gift card that had a lot of money on it. And I've been ordering pizza and I still have credit on it. Uh, And they made me an amazing plaque with my jacket that I used to wear at all the events with play with all of my memorabilia. And 
for anyone watching this, you know, on YouTube, as opposed to yep. listening, here's a visual medium. I'm going to bring oh, it up. Oh man, you can get up. It's all good. He's uh, I like that sign on the wall there right next to you. So That's a good this sign. Is pretty cool. My first year, they released the Pizza Hut Pie Top Sneaker. Nice, pie top. Only 64 pairs were made for the NCAA cool. tournament. This is one of 64 pairs, the pie right. top. It has a button right here that just how Uber knows where you are, you know, with geo tracking location. Yep. I hit this button, it orders a pizza directly oh. to my shoes. Really? So, I have my preset, you know, settings, pepperoni pizza, meat lovers, whatever it is I want. I hit the button and it orders it. And then the next year, that's awesome. It came out with the PT2s, the Pie Top 2s. See, Pizza Hut here. And that these, is sweet. This sneaker, same thing, orders pizza to your shoe in the button. And yeah. the other sneaker, you hit the button and it pairs up with your television so that when the pizza guy comes, you hit the button, it'll pause the game so you don't miss any action when you go to get the pizza. <laughs> they both 100% work. I have done both uh, in real life and on camera and they're some original shoes that are you know worth a lot of money now too. Uh, That's so awesome. Yeah. I, I don't have free pizza for life, but I do have enough pizza goodies to get me by for a lifetime. I would say you do, man. And uh, with the two, uh, the two pie tops, so that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, might be a hard question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. The most unique place that your job has taken you over the years? Man, wow. That, that is a very hard question because I've been so lucky with all these crazy adventures that yeah. I've done. You right. Know, uh, most unique. I mean... Right. A country or you know you bungee jumped and did an open for a show or something like that or yeah, is that a wow. new idea i just planted in your that head that is a new idea i like this idea <laughs> I, saw your eyes I have up. gone skydiving but that was just for me that was that was not on on television okay. um you know with because i'm thinking pizza hut right now because what we're just talking about and all those ncaa championships yeah. the uh, ncaa women's bowling championship was one of the most unique experiences I've ever had. Huh. Uh, it was one of the most exciting events I've ever been to, and that wow. was shocking to me. I do not expect a women's bowling championship to be no. like that. But no. there's a Nebraska has a powerhouse. They're like a dynasty of really? women's bowling, and they were there against like McKendry State or someone that I like I had never even heard of. This yeah. underdog school, and it was this battle because it's kind of unique. It's an individual sport, but they set it up as a team sport, almost like a baseball roster. There's, I think, five or six women who are bowling. So I, I go first, you go second, then third, then fourth, but they do it as a team. So it's like I, I am the, fifth, the first inning and the fifth inning, and you're the second and the sixth or whatever. So it's an individual sport, but within a team sport like arrangement, and the tension and the pressure that goes down because they're so good. If you don't bowl a strike or a spare, you're screwed. And the pressure builds and builds and builds. Right. I don't know. I, I'm, that's probably not the most unique or most exciting event, but I'm just thinking about it right now because no, it's so bizarre. It, yeah. it was it was really fascinating and uh, like very exciting. And there was maybe. 50 people in the audience. It was not a big draw. It was not a big draw, but it was, I was pumped. That's pretty cool, man. Uh, <laughs> favorite lines from the movie Major League, of course, on your Cleveland Indians. I have to ask. Just a bit outside. I mean, Bob Euchre, Bob Euchre is so great, especially what we do as an announcer, what you do play by play. Yep. I mean, one of the most lovable, likable uh, characters and people of all time, Bob Euchre. Have you um, met him? He's just so great uh, in that movie. Uh, just watching the hapless Cleveland Indians, you know, as he's drinking in the broadcast booth and yeah. just trying to. Get I can't find it. The hell with it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Have you, you met are him? The biggest movie quote guy and Seinfeld quote guy I've ever <laughs> met in my entire life. I know. I would say I'm proud to know about 50 percent of what the hell you're talking about when you're getting, dropping this quote. <laughs> and I think that's good. There's often quotes you'll you'll just say like. <laughs> not today, Johnny. And I'm like, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. But of course, I know you're quoting Seinfeld. I just, I, I don't remember this episode. You're just, yeah. Have you, have, you, have you met Bobby? Have you ever met Euchre? I've never met him. No, no. no. Yeah. Maybe one day. Have you? Uh, I have not. No, mm. I'd love to. I'd love to have dinner with him, man, and just talk. That would be incredible. That's yeah, that to me, there's a lot of great baseball movies and feel free, obviously. 
Yeah. Um, to me, that one's right at the top of the list, man. I know Bull Durham's great and the sure. natural and Field of Dreams. But to me, man, the best. Major League is, is the best baseball movie ever. I agree. Well, especially because, you know, I wasn't used to Cleveland teams winning anything. Right. That was my winning team, was the yep. team in Major League. That was my franchise. And the characters are so great. It's so funny, but it's heartfelt, too. It's it's a really – I agree. I think that's the best baseball movie of all time. I'm biased, but for sure. Yeah, I get it. Understandable. How about yeah. Charlie Sheen? Have you ever done anything with him? You ever met him? You ever interviewed him? I'm not – I signed an NDA. I'm not allowed to talk about what I've done with Charlie Sheen. <laughs> Yeah, he told me he paid me well. Uh, no, I've not done anything with Charlie Sheen uh, or his Tiger Blood is what I'm right. obligated contractually to say. Yeah, no you idea. don't hear anything about him anymore. You're out in L.A. Do you hear anything about him or no, do you? No, I think it's good. I think it's he's quiet no, I down. Do too. I think that's I'm a good just, thing. Yeah, no, I'm just he's, surprised. He's it is. He's laying low. He's laying low. I think he's mellowed out a little bit. <laughs> you know, the Tiger Blood. It's now from Tiger Blood to Tiger King. We've moved on. Right. Yeah, exactly. Are you, by the way, I've watched some of your episodes. Are you sponsored by Tim Hortons? Because I think you should hit them up. You, no, you're I like subtle be, product placement every episode. Yeah, you're fueled I, by it. I know, man. I need, to fo- I need to follow your lead a little bit on some of this stuff, brother. Yeah, hit them up. Hit them up on social. Say, I got yep. 51 episodes, you know, with the brand guy. I got, I got a Tim resume Hortons. tape, right? Send me some coffee. Yeah. I got, I got a resume tape, certainly. So, yeah, exactly. um, is there anything else that you, uh, in your, in your career? For my life? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, again, I mean, okay. I, here's a few things, folks, I wrote down. Just some oh, notes like on this. my old school reporter notepad, right? Nice. You had one of those at Syracuse, right? Yeah, I got some of those, yeah. So, I had coaster, get, or coaster barbecue, <laughs> Gillette, Butterfinger, Tailgate 48, which we talked about, Chopped, Pizza yeah. Hut the NBA, the NBA All-Star game. You were at the Major League All-Star game and was in Cleveland last year, right? Last year, yeah. yeah. Was, tell, us, tell us about that. What would you do there? I was for home runs, right? For the home and derby? Oh, I was there for that. It was a blast. Yeah, I was working for a company called Homage. They're a great t-shirt company. I recommend you. They're based in Ohio. Check them out. Okay. Homage.com. Awesome stuff. You would love it. A lot of Seinfeld gear, pop culture stuff, sports. It's awesome. Cool. Really soft You have shirt. a deal with them too? Uh, I, I am a spokesman for them and I do trivia <laughs> on their uh, social media. Yeah. But Go I love ahead, it. I didn't mean to interrupt. So I was, I, they had a pop-up shop at the all-star game in Cleveland last year. So I was kind of like their the voice and face of the brand taking right. uh, all of their followers yeah. through all the experiences and at the shop and hosting live events and things and interviews. Yeah. Um, so that's what I was doing there. And it was great to be, you know, in my hometown and it's beautiful yeah. weather, baseball, star game outdoors. It was great. Um, so yeah, that, that's what I was doing at that. But we went to the home run derby together and we had seats up in the nosebleeds. It was one of the most exciting home run derbies of all time. I don't know if you yeah. remember the 2019. Home I do. Run derby. It was amazing with, uh, yep. Vlad Guerrero and, uh, who was it from the Dodgers? Cody, was it Bellinger? Uh, Bell- was Alonzo on that one too? Yes, it was. But um, yeah, the, the two guys. Cody were Bellinger. Eating. Was it Bellinger? I can't believe. I think it was. Um, yeah. I, it was one of the guys from the Dodgers. I'm blanking right now on who it was. But this amazing back and forth. And we went out to the home run porch. And I caught it on video. I got a home run ball during the home run derby on video for their social media. It was, it was a blast. It was a really cool experience. Um, some of the things that I'm doing right now, obviously, I know you yep. through the World Arm Wrestling League, which... Uh, I've been on for the last two years. You were already yep. a veteran uh, of the sport at that time. <laughs> well, uh, I knew very little about professional arm wrestling when I started. Same here, brother. But I learned a lot through you and through uh, the Neil. rest of the crew and the rest of, you know, rest of no. the guys and have really fallen in love with uh, the competition. I mean, it's such a relatable sport. Everyone has tried arm wrestling, but when you yep. really get into it, all the technique that they use, the personalities, and it's been fun you know, working with you on something that I think we both believe has the potential to be really big. Just more people need to, to watch it and get into it that it really could be a sport on the rise. I, I'm with you. I mean, I've been involved with it now. This will be, what, year six? Wow. Um, we missed a year in there. I think the year before, yeah, the year before you joined us. Yeah. Um, and, and, and Steve, you know, just financially, it wasn't going to work out. Mm. And, you know, I'm like you, man. I, so you remember last year we're in Tulsa, Jeff Hale, of course, in his hometown, he goes yes. against Adam Wilmot. Of course. And, that, and Wilmot had him. And, yeah. you know, he, he let him off the hook. 
pun intended. Yeah, right. Um, and if you're watching, Adam, I'm, we're looking forward to seeing you in Chicago when you go against Jamie Sheldon. But uh, Adam was the first guy I ever met. Um, wow. I did a hockey game the night before in North Dakota and made my way from Grand Forks to New Orleans later that day or the next day. And Adam came out front, and he was the guy that Kaplan had sent out to meet me. He's like, go wow. get Benny's here in a cab. And he was, you know, just getting involved in the league and stuff. And so yeah. I'm right there with you. I didn't know anything about it. But I do, to your point, man, I, I, I believe in it, man. I think it's, you know, it's everybody arm wrestle, you know, in school. Let's arm wrestle. Arm wrestle you for it, right? Right, right. So it's fun. And, you know, I really enjoy it. The people are tremendous. Um, I, you know, you certainly talk to it as well. I mean, I – to me, it reminds me a lot of hockey and lacrosse, and I've grown up in those sports with myself and then my son and being around it like you have with basketball. Um, it's just – it's family. Everybody knows each other. It's it's close-knit. The people are great. I don't know. that. I mean, it's I'd have to search long and hard, Jay, to find people that are better people than the people we get to deal with when we work those shows. Totally. I agree. Yeah, really good people who, uh, you know, they all they all have other jobs and other careers yep. and professions. And this is just something yep. they do because they're they're passionate about it and they devote so much of their lives uh, to this sport and to training. And, you know, even the stories of how these athletes get themselves to the events that we do, some yep. traveling all over the world for days at a time, some, yeah. you know, packing up a car and driving with the family across the country. It's, it mm -hmm. really is a, a amazing thing to be a part of. It's been a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, I hope that, you know, in this year, obviously the season has been uh, shifted uh, that it's still able to, to, to go down, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I hope then, so too. We're supposed to. What's that? Well, Sorry. I was gonna say, and then another thing we both have in common is we both uh, were reporters for the uh, Alliance of American Football, the short-lived <laughs> football league that yep. uh, came in hot and went away quick. Uh, <laughs> went out hot. It went out hot. Yeah, it was <laughs> a lot of fun while it was going. We never got to work on the same broadcast team. You, of course, with CBS, and I was on the NFL Network broadcast, yep. but. Uh, doing that was an amazing experience for me because uh, I had never done uh, sideline reporting for for professional football or really oh, wow. football. I didn't uh, know so that. That was my first time doing that, and and again another experience where I just worked with so many great guys from Steve Mariucci and yep. Andrew Siciliano and uh, 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 Marvin Lewis, uh, yep. Sean O'Hara like really good people with great stories. And, and that's like, we started this podcast. That's what I miss most is all the things around these events, the time spent with each other, sharing the stories uh, and the experiences. I, I miss that connecting with people right now while we're all kind of locked in our own bubbles. Yeah, I'm right there with you. So we're uh, hopefully we'll see each other in, uh, in August in uh, what about four, about five weeks, I guess, right? That'd be great, yeah. um, We're going to do, right now, we're supposed to do five shows there and then one in uh, down in Atlanta and, and uh, in the championship there. So uh, before I let you go, my friend, your top five Cleveland athletes all time. Doesn't oh, matter what sport, it. just give me your top five. It doesn't have to be in order? No, whatever you want, man. Well, just your, your favorite five. One, LeBron James, of course. Yep. I mean, thank you for the championship in 2016. And really growing up as a Cavs fan uh, and a basketball fan, LeBron being from there, I went to a lot of his high school games. Started Did when you? he was a sophomore in high school. I saw him at St. Vincent St. Mary. And one of my best friends growing up, this guy, uh, this kid, Sekou Lewis, we played basketball together. He transferred to play with LeBron So I in high school. So I used to go watch my friend play basketball. Oh, yeah, and his teammate's pretty good, LeBron James. He's pretty so good. I became a LeBron <laughs> fan when he was in high school. And was a huge Cavs fan. And when those worlds collided, it was, I mean, it was the greatest thing I could ever imagine and envision. So he is a clear number one. Number, all right. number two is my favorite Cleveland Indian of all time, Kenny Lofton. Loved him. I loved Kenny Lofton. It was incredible in the field. I always wanted to be a center fielder or play that. He would rob home runs. He was so fast. He'd steal bases. He was clutch. He would get the key hit home run, single, whatever was needed. I remember, uh, I think it was the 95 uh, American League Championship Series, the Indians against uh, A-Rod and Ken Griffey Jr., Randy Johnson, the yeah, Seattle, yeah. Seattle Mariners team. And Kenny Lofton went from second base all the way home on a, on a crazy play. I think he stole them both or something insane, and we scored. And, like, no one more exhilarating or more fun for me than, than Kenny Lofton. Um, 
Let's see. You know, I would say from the Browns, you know, my era, Joe Thomas, hard okay. to get like fired up about an offensive lineman, right. but he is a hall of famer. I'm yep. so impressed with him, uh, who he is as a person and as a, a role mm -hmm. model, uh, an ambassador for the city of Cleveland, for the Browns franchise and the sport. He dealt with so many losing seasons, huh. so many loss games, just the nightmare, different head coach every year, like multiple quarterbacks, just the, maybe you said perhaps the worst run franchise in sports for the tenure he was there mm -hmm. and he never missed a snap. Unbelievable as the crazy, the longest streak of not even missing a snap. I mean, that is Cleveland through and through. So yeah. I, Joe Thomas for sure. Um, I'm going to say Mark Price. He was my first favorite player, Cavs player of all time. I have hanging up here on my wall. Uh, I wrote him a letter when I was a little kid and he wrote me back a, a, nice. a very thoughtful letter back with a signed autograph. Uh, nice. Uh, August 15th, 1993. It's hanging on my wall right here. Uh, cool. Mark Price right on the money. Uh, greatest free throw shooter maybe of all time. I think he still might hold the record for percentage, highest percentage. It was like 92% or something like that. Um, he was just always solid. I loved him. So that leaves, let's see, one more spot left. Who is it's, it? It's tough. Uh, you know, oh, man. I'll, I'll probably say Omar Vizquel. Uh, really? Yeah, Omar okay. just loved his personality. Gold gloves, a lot of flair, a lot of pizzazz. Uh, I'll go Omar. Honorable mention to Kyrie Irving. He did hit the shot. I've gotten to know him over the years and uh, do some things with him, and he's a really uh, great guy. Um, and honorable mention to uh, Albert Bell in his heyday. I mean – I didn't put him in my top five because he's kind of an <laughs> asshole uh, and Omar was a good guy. But, but there was nothing more exciting than those mid-90s teams. Albert Bell's coming to the plate, and every time you knew, like, he, he might hit a home run, and he yeah. often did. He lived up to it. It was so exciting. It was so much fun. So, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure I'll call you and try to add someone else later Edited. to that list. But that, that's well, my top five. That's a good list, man. I, I say this as a Detroit sports fan. Uh, with the exception of the Lions, because when Barry Sanders walked, Jay, I gave up. I'm like, I'm done. If Barry can't play for these clowns, I'm done. Yeah. Um, Jim Tomey was a guy I yeah. loved watching him play. I great. wish I could have seen him in a Tiger uniform. I got something to show you. It might take me a minute. That's all so right. So can you, you can I, fill I'll, for I'll 20 fill. seconds? I, I left out. I got some. I left out Jim Tomey, uh, of course, uh, oh, a legend. Put him on there. And, all right, and I mean, the one person I left out who is the greatest athlete in Cleveland sports history is Jim Brown. He's just not really from my era. I never had the opportunity to see Jim Brown play in person. But yeah. I, I would say I'd probably put Jim Brown on the list over Omar Vizquel. I just got a chance to witness Omar Vizquel and the things he would do in the field. Even with that? Oh, nice. That's pretty cool. Is that so, Dave Concepcion? Yeah, medic, uh, 14 combined gold gloves. It was from Medical Mutual. Yeah. Uh, there you go. I, wonder, so. I, I do not have that. I do not have that. I one got a few Cavs ones in there, but I work for the team, as you know. So, I mean, right. I, got a, I got quite a bit of Cavs stuff. Oh, okay. Nice. Yeah. yeah maybe we'll do yeah. the swap here. If I can find some <laughs> hockey here, you know. We'll I'll trade it. you a bobblehead for some razor blades. Oh, I got that. I will say, you didn't ask me this, but I have not – bought a Gillette razor since 2010 is when I won that contest. <laughs> I'm going on a decade worth I love of it. razor blades. I've had, just had boxes of them. So See, I, that, I've made that last. That's uh, you know, I've trained my son well in that, you know, I'm like, dude, if it's free, I'll take three, man. You know, it's <laughs> like, it's part of what we do, man. And you got, you got a nice collection there behind you too, bud. Yeah. I got some good stuff, some good bobbleheads, some pretty cool memorabilia. There's uh, yeah. I've got I've got some some fun pieces, you know. It's like you said, what we do for a living. It takes us to so many great places, great yep. people, and you often collect a lot of pretty fun things, you know, through those yep. experiences. So, uh, la uh, lastly, before I let you go, yeah, uh, tell me about Center Court. You're working with the seven four Center now, man, and uh, with Ralph yeah. Sampson. You guys just started that podcast this week, right? 
That's right. Yeah, well, there's one episode. You're on episode 51. We're on episode one right now. Uh, I met uh, NBA Hall of Famer Ralph Sampson a few years ago, and we actually had a radio show together when oh, he was did. living in L.A. Um, okay. He's such a legend uh, in the University of Virginia and in Virginia and down in the South. So yep. he had various ESPN radio affiliates in the South. He had an hour of airtime that they gave him, uh, and we would – uh, do a radio show every week when we talk to amazing, interesting guests, you know, from uh, good friends of his, Calvin Murphy, Elvin Hayes, uh, Malcolm Brogdon, all these guys with different Virginia ties and, yeah. and uh, NBA ties to him. And uh, it was a blast. And we've always kept in touch, but especially during this quarantine time where we're looking for creative outlets and things to stay busy and active, we thought we should take what we did before to a larger audience that's not just to radio, but obviously podcasts where anyone can hear it. So right. uh, we've started, you know, focusing on that over these last couple of weeks. And uh, we just put out our first episode. We just recorded the next two episodes. And we had a meeting earlier today about what other guests we should line up. And, you know, we're, we're ramping it up. I'm excited about it. It's available on iTunes, Spotify, anywhere you get a podcast, all those places, uh, yep. Center Court with Ralph Sampson and Jason Zone Fisher. And, uh, uh, you know, it's fun. I think it's going to be a, a fun journey, uh, you know, just as you're really enjoying what you're doing and, and putting these together, chatting with people, you know, we're, yep. we're trying to do the same thing. So uh, is it all basketball or what, else, what other things are you getting into? Yeah, no, it's not all basketball. Now, most okay. of it will come back to a lot of our guests will be in the basketball yeah, yeah. world, given who he is and just right. the people that he knows. But um, our, our second episode, actually, we have a a scientist from the University of Virginia who has uh, an NSF National Science Foundation grant, uh, research grant, learning more about COVID-19 and what it does and how to nice. stop the spread of it. So we're, we relate it all back to sports and, you know, how it has affected our lives and the sports world, COVID-19. But we're also talking to people uh, outside of the sports world like him. Um, and we're yeah. our, our third episode, we have um, our guest is Arthur Motes. He played nine years in the NFL with the Buffalo Bills and the Pittsburgh Steelers, a linebacker. Heard of him, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. He has a podcast as well and is a really great personality. So he's our third guest. So it'll be from all the sports world, probably a lot of focus on basketball given who Ralph is and his career, but, but we're going to, we're going to cover it all. How that's awesome. So you're, how many are you doing like every other day or what's the well, one a week, one a week, one a week. come out. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Every Tuesday they'll be released. And uh, follow you on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Yeah, what else am I on missing? Instagram, Instagram and Twitter. I'm probably most active on Instagram. Jay Z fish, Jay Z F I S H. As you know, now my real middle yeah. name is zone. So yeah. Jay Z fish. It's, I mean, it, it's, it writes itself, man. Like, <laughs> Throwing to Jason when we're doing shows for the World Arm Wrestling League is awesome. He's yeah, always yeah. in the zone. Yeah, you got you're you're good at this. The king of the segways over here, Ben <laughs> Holden. You know it. You know how to work in the zone. I'm always in the zone. It's a gift. I and try, a man. When I'm um, not being tossed around by the arm wrestlers. It, well, yeah. I mean, uh, Todd Hutchings was that last year or two years ago? Uh, both, both. They, well, oh, that's right. Both. Yeah, he thing. did. Yeah, he, he likes to celebrate by uh, by picking bench me up. pressing you. Yeah, throwing me around, which is uh, always, uh, you know, it's an exhilarating feeling. You never know. You <laughs> totally lose control. Okay, I lied. Coaster I got to ask. What's that? It's bringing a little Coaster Quest flair to arm wrestling when I'm throwing. Yeah, I like that, man. Wrestling. I like yeah. that. So I lied. I got one more thing for you. Yeah. Uh, your young daughter is two. Yeah. So girl dad. Awesome. That's right. Um, in what ways – has that changed your life? I know there's many, but give me a couple examples of the way it's changed your life the most, man. Uh, I mean, more than anything, it just puts everything in perspective when you become a father, when you're, you know, the things that you're doing aren't just for yourself. It's for, it's for others. And, and for your daughter, it's seen legacy. She looks a lot like me. Like when I was a kid, we are twins. So it's weird, like looking back and it, even almost having memories of myself as a young kid, as I see her doing something, remembering me do that, it's it's like a weird mind trip. It's it, it just puts everything in perspective, and especially this time, this year, 
everything yep. that we're going through as uh, you know as a society and as a country um, it, it just helps ground you and you know remember what is truly important at the end of the day uh, I was bummed for a little while about the jobs that I missed or the trips that were canceled and really at the end of the day yeah that's a bummer but it doesn't matter all that all that really matters is is her and is our health and legacy and and you know making the world a better place for her and for the future and you know it's uh the, the world is a scary place right now but it makes me it motivates me to want to work even harder uh yeah. to leave things better for her and for the future because we need to work harder to ensure that with everything that's going on yeah nice man that's great that's awesome happy for you and your wife and uh thanks uh, is she is your daughter woke up yet or you still got time she, I, I still got time <laughs> I, I said I'm podcasting for who knows how long so <laughs> I got time she is still sleeping but also Caitlin is home and she will be on in charge of her that's why I'm saying can we can we stretch this out for six seven sure minutes, I mean we, we can drink? drink a couple more man I mean I, <laughs> I'm game I'm you know I'm just trying to broaden my horizons a little bit here during this and you know, it's just so weird. I mean, I, I haven't been home this long since I worked in, in local sports, you know, and totally you're talking, you're talking 16 years, man. Like, and I know you, you try, I think you travel more than I do at the end well, of the day. At, at given times, I mean, you're, uh, you have been under contract with CBS. So you kind of know the, the natural rhythms of right. where you're going to be when yeah. it falls into a pattern. With yep. me, it ebbs and flows. There can be a month where I'm home for a month, and then there can be yeah. another month where I'm home three days because I'm going from this job to that job. Literally, I remember last year doing arm wrestling. There were trips I had a job in Vegas. I would fly from Vegas to Baltimore for arm wrestling. I remember that. Baltimore yeah. to, to a different city for a different job and, like, all over. So, um, you know, it's, it's a lot to keep track of at, at certain times, I would say, too. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, this so, yeah, was fun, it, man. It was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Thank you for, for having me on. I really appreciate it. Thanks for coming on and doing it. And, uh, you know, I hope that we see each other in about five weeks, my brother. I hope so, too. It'd be great. I, I, miss, uh, I miss being with people. I miss live sports. Uh, you know, I miss it all. I miss the travel, the hustle, the work. So it would be great to, as we start taking baby steps back into society and back into normalcy, it'd be great to get back into those rhythms together, calling live sports. And the reason I love sports so much, you never know what's going to happen. You never know what's going to unfold. So I can't wait for that to get back, that real yeah. life drama. As I like to say, the ultimate reality TV, man, like you said, man, it's uh... it is. Nothing better, man. Well, Jay, thanks for this. We appreciate it, or I appreciate it. My son's not next to me today, so which is a little different, but it's all good. Yeah. Um, thanks for this, man. Best to you and your family, and uh, we'll see you in Chicago here in hopefully a few weeks, man. All right. Same to you. Thanks for all having right. me on. No problem. Jason Zone Fisher, our guest today on episode 51 of No Holding Back. Until next time, Ben Holden, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.